<laughs> How you doing, man? Do you I'm right? very good. How are you? Good you? Welcome to Ember. Thank you. Incredible. Have you had it? Since November 2016. Why did you do what you did? There's no good reason. It's been an exciting project. There are cheaper things to do for midlife crisis. Oh, yeah, yeah. Last time we met, you were telling me, I think it's like 45% growth year on year for the last six years. Yeah. Beating that this year, about the same? Well, we're, we're going to beat it, and uh, I think it's the international expansion that's going to help with that. And when you first launched, you talked about uh, being a boutique agency with global reach. Is that still the ambition? Yes. I think one of the interesting changes is that we're going to probably not be referencing ourselves as an agency as much. Makes so the sense. strap line, the biggest boutique agency, is mm. probably going to come to a natural end. Yeah. And we're going to talk more about being your digital partner. Got it. Um, the ecosystem doesn't always require an, an agency. It's related to media buying, and a lot of the time we're actually enabling. So it's all more about the data, the technology, training. Yeah. So I think we're moving away from the agency, but the essence of having a boutique-style offering, yeah. but with scale and having a, a global presence, that's still the same. So, so on that, though, I mean, obviously you're getting up to, what, you're six, 700 people now, you know, well on track to get that 1,000 mark that we spoke about two or three years ago. Um, that's a lot of people, right? And, and, you know, if you're still talking about having a boutique-type approach, it becomes more challenging as you get bigger and bigger. Yeah. How, do you, how do you manage that? Well, I think it's... It, I mean, if you've got the vision, yeah. it's like everything. If everybody knows that's what we're trying to achieve, mm. it changes your behaviour. So we, we keep things in hubs. We make sure that we don't lose all those little things that actually make it feel like a family. What, what, do, you mean? what do you mean about hubs? Just give me an example of a hub. So, so as an example, even in the UK agency, it's yeah. broken down into three hubs where yeah. all the practitioners and the capability experts, yeah. the client services, project management, marketing and, and so on, they all work together in a Got group. It. So we're almost creating these little boutique agencies within our agency. And our thematic goal for our organisation is to be able to truly service a global client and yeah. make sure that we've got a consistent proposition right across the board. Mm. And in an ideal world, we'll be picking up three or four global yeah. brands. The bar's called Ember. Talk me through why. Well, as you know, we're on Pudding Lane, yeah. where the Great Five of London started. Of course. Great Five of London started in a bakery. Yeah. Could this be it? Oh, well, we're not sure. We should okay. find that out. So this is walking down Pudding Lane. So I imagine the monument must be yeah, it's just somewhere near right. here. When the Great Five London happened, obviously the streets were much closer together. Pretty if you sure remember it's... the story from, from school days, the fire jumped actually over the street. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And that's right. why it caught so quickly. That's because right. all the houses at the top virtually touched each other. Oh, it's it really stored in it your just, brain. I think it's something I learned when I was about nine years old. Wow. And it just stuck with that's me. That's incredible. If we go back sort of 50 years, marketing was a lot more straightforward. How are clients adapting themselves so that they can almost like keep pace with what you're doing and they can understand how best to take advantage of the information that you're giving them. It depends on the, the client and the team that they've got. So from fully outsourcing to fully insourcing, yeah. we sort of play in the full spectrum. You know, it used to be, yes, the one message to many. Mm. Nowadays, you can <laughs> find through most of the digital platforms, 95% of the people everywhere. It's unlimited media. So with yeah. the right data, you can actually seek them down and find them and put the, the right message in front of them. Most importantly, brands are going to want to own their mm. data. But is there a limit to the size of a, of a brand before they should own their data? It shouldn't be. I mean, okay. and in some cases, I think I agree. So, some businesses, their data is more valuable than their product or service. Yep. It may sound crazy, but mm. that is actually the, a fact. I think you should always own that piece. You know, there's loads and loads of debate in the industry about future of agencies. And now we're seeing quite a different type of convergence where some are running much, much harder in terms of, you know, the use of data and technology and the kind of the flexibility with model in terms of, you know, how much does a client do versus how much does a partner do yeah. and everything between like you talk about. Um, it'd be really good to, to get your view on, on, you know, how this has evolved for you guys and, and where you think it's going to go next. So where we're at, because yeah. we've got such a view and we've got access to the alphas, we go to industry events, yeah. we're, we've got a bunch of people challenging each other, we are in a car going 100 miles an hour. The issue is, if you then take, you, if you're out of our environment and you go and you try and do it in-house, it will be like standing on the side of a motorway when a car goes past at 100 miles. But the reality is that marketing can sometimes be seen as a cost, not a value add. And the services that you guys are providing and others in the market are providing, 
to do them incredibly well, they're, they're not cheap. How do you weigh that up with the clients that you're working with so that you know, you're, you're getting paid the right fee for, for the work that you're doing so that you know, it becomes an obvious partnership with the client as well as it is with Google? Mate, you've struck upon our biggest challenge because you don't know, there's no frame of reference. We can't yeah. live in a parallel universe. Yeah. So we don't know what it would have been if we weren't doing it. You know, there's some clients that are yeah. on a decline and we will get them to only be 2% down on last year. Mm. What do the board see? You're two percent down on last year. Yep. It could have been thirty. Yep. So you're right. So the opportunity cost of not doing it is difficult to quantify. It's yeah. Well articulated. <laughs> <laughs> is this this is my locker? Wow. <laughs> I love it. My name on the plaque and everything. Exactly. Yeah. So how, how does this work? I've never had a locker before. Well, so it's a bit like a members club. Uh huh. You can choose whatever you want in there. Yeah. And we have the bottles, and then it's all um, displayed for you. And you come down with your with your family or your clients or whatever, and you can just enjoy and have a drink. Love it. So some rum would perhaps be a good yeah. idea. Maybe I'd let you choose the rum. So I've got I've, in my locker. I've got the Plantation 2003 from Trinidad. Is that a good one? Oh well, yeah. I mean that that's quality stuff. But it, you know, just being. Okay. Brand loyal. To okay. My, yeah, yeah. To my yeah, home, yeah. my home country. Over the course of the time I've known you, you know, you've tended to invest ahead of the curve mm -hmm. quite often. Yeah. And most of those, I mean, let's not call them bets actually, let's call them investments, have tended to pay off. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me a little bit about your, your decision making and, and how that kind of bleeds into leadership and how, you know, your team really kind of keeps up with you when you're, when you're moving at such pace and, and you're making decisions so quickly, which affect what is now 700 people and rising. Yeah, I mean, well, the first thing is the culture is um, I'm allowed, I've afforded myself um, the flexibility to always make decisions current. So uh -huh. um, I say to everybody, don't tell me what I said before, I have to actually explain why we're pivoting and making a new decision. That could be new technology, new experience, it could be um, more data, it, it, there's a number of reasons so, why you should be able to. Pivot. So it's almost ripping up that 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 kind of slightly annoying notion, which often comes up, which is, well, this is the way I've always done it. Exactly. When you're hiring, are you purposely looking for people who naturally are, are, are comfortable in that environment? How, how, I mean, how do you how do you find them? How do you test for that when you're going through an interview process? Well, it's just it's it's a conversation. It's yep. like a, I can pick up on somebody that actually is innovative, embraces change, is excited about where things are going. Really? I'm much more looking for aptitude. Um, and ambition mm. and uh, you know, the, the, the ability to perform the job uh, in the way that we like from a cultural standpoint. Yeah. We could always teach the actual skills. So mm. um, the involvement, some of the things that are happening within our organization, uh, particularly in digital, one of the exciting things is our global leadership team. We've got yeah. a 15 person global leadership team. No one's ever left. We didn't have 20 offices globally last year. We weren't dealing with the type of clients we're dealing with now. Technology wasn't the same. We didn't have as many partnerships. How'd you find the time? How do I find the time? Yeah. Investing in the things that matter. Having invested my time in this global leadership team mm. has created time. Because there's autonomy, mm. I, I trust them, they know we're all one single vision. That's what we're going for in our organisation. We all know our strengths and weaknesses. We put each other back to back and we cater for um, where people aren't performing. Absolutely, and that's trust. And that can only come... Huge. It can only come over time. Yeah, you, know, you can only right. build type trust. Authentic tr trust comes with elapsed time, yeah. yeah. So we're creating time mm -hmm. by actually making sure that people have the commander's intent, the vision, and they're the right people. Things happen. Yeah. The workforce that's coming through now, they've got very different expectations of the business that they want to work for and therefore, you know, the, the interaction they're going to have on a day-to-day -day basis. I think it's a, it's a fascinating topic, one that I'm, I'm a little bit obsessed with. And I think, you know, the more that we can do to sort of share our own experiences, things that are working and not working, the better we're going to make the industry and the workplace yeah. um, uh, overall. Matt, I, I, love, I love talking to you. I love catching up, but I'm starving. I thought you were never going to ask, Rob. <laughs> we're sitting in a restaurant. Let's go.